this this will be edited, of course, uh, so I will not use uh, the film as it is, just for your information. So we know what's what's on here. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. I'm Anders from Sweden. I uh, work as a freelance journalist. I've been covering open data for a pretty long time, writing a couple of uh, books, uh, and uh, I'm impressed by Taiwan in many ways, and I'm happy to be here to ask you some, uh, some questions about it. And uh, uh, especially your work with the, with the government uh, and so. So, so um, we have been emailing, exchanging some, some uh, questions and answers already through, through the web-based system. Uh, but uh, here we can elaborate a little bit more, I'm, I'm thinking. So, um, the, the most, so to say, first and most central question is how are you making the government uh, more transparent? Right. <coughs> um, do you want me to go into the specifics or do you want an overview? So, uh, I'll be happy to, to, because you have said that you, you do th through radical uh, transparency, transparency right. etc. So, just quick the overview and then some details about it. Okay, sure. Um, which camera do I look so at? You, you, you can talk to me, uh, okay. and they, they will, the cameras will be here, and uh, you don't okay. need to... Uh, so that, that's a side cam? In, in that's the side cam. Uh, uh -huh. I might use it, I might not use uh, okay. uh, the extra. So do you read Chinese, or, or can I, sh should I just translate everything? Uh, I cannot read Chinese, okay. unfortunately. So I'll just translate everything, okay. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so that came is is recording this screen. So you you'll have the footage of the presentation also. Yeah, um, which camera is? And th that's the camera. Okay, the, the one it. that's shining green. Yes. Okay, right. So um, transparency uh, for me is a uh, instrument. It is not a end in itself. Um, the end goal of transparency or radical transparency, as you put it, uh, is to rebuild trust uh, between the civil society and the government, as well as between different stakeholders in the civil society. Uh, and so that is the, our driving value. So everything that we do is centered around this rebuilding um, um, trust. And uh, on the civil society side, of course, uh, I'm the minister uh, with a portfolio in charge of social innovation uh, and youth empowerment. And in that, we try to build a civil society that can look at new issues uh, facing the society and instead of waiting for the government to fix it, instead take proactive action uh, to solve it and then share the result with the government. And so this is a very different uh, idea from this top-down approach of policy making. And it enables um, a lot of agency from the civil society, especially when they see that they are also data producers. Uh, in many countries, uh, the, the open data policy focuses on government open data, right? So it's as if open data just means government open data. But in Taiwan, it, it, it's not like that. Uh, when we're saying open data policy or transparency policy, we see the civil society, the private sector, as equals, as peers, mm -hmm. as also data producers. And so um, one of the concrete uh, example is the GovZero movement. Yeah. The GovZero movement uh, takes the idea that any government website that should exist but doesn't yet uh, the civil society make a G0V.TW counterpart. And so instead of the GOV government website, you go into the shadow government. So for example, uh, this is what the civil society thinks should the government should do, but doesn't yet. This is the air pollution map mm. of PM 2.5, as well as other uh, substances in the air. At the moment, uh, there's only very limited uh, measurement stations uh, set up by, by the government. And so the resolution, the, the granularity of data is not so good. And so this is basically citizen science, people donating uh, their um, houses, their roofs, uh, the kindergartens or schools or whatever to set up uh, citizen measurement devices and then sharing the data uh, under a radically transparent uh, way. And I think the um, distinction that we make here is that we see the trust is, is mutual. So if the government uh, affirms 
this kind of citizen science and also uses this in our policy making and also commit to calibrate our data um, with the citizen produced data and essentially aggregates all the different sources of data into a supercomputer center for example allowing independent uh, researchers to run models and, and whatever this builds a platform on which the civil society people can make their own interventions but nevertheless uh, it's based on the same factual data as the government policy makers so this is basically us saying uh, we respect the civil society and private sector actors as peers and then we do policy making by looking at the social innovations that's perhaps done on a local level or on a smaller scale and then we amplify those good ideas so that's the left side of my work which is social innovation and youth empowerment. Uh, may I just talk yeah. about this air, yes. the air pollution thing? Yes. I mean uh, when you have uh, of course the, the, the quality of the measurements mm -hmm. uh, when you have the governmental yes uh, devices, yes. they, the, 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 the quality of the data is, is probably pretty high, while you have the data from the um, uh, crowd, mm -hmm. uh, which by have not be so accurate, we mm -hmm. don't know, it can be very accurate, it can be le mm -hmm. less accurate, good accurate. Mm -hmm. how, how can that be taken into part in what we just saw here? I mean, how can you help building trust mm -hmm. by merging by mixing so to say the high quality data with mm -hmm. mm, more uncertain data mm -hmm. No, I, I think uh, it's not by default that it just is because it's produced by the uh, citizens that it's automatically lower quality. No, no, of course not. Yeah, I'm talking uh, about the technical, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a device created, I, I made this myself, uh -huh. a device for uh, uh -huh. 30 euro, euro measuring right. the, uh, the, the... The air box, uh, they are in, in, something in, like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, while a governmental device might cost one million or ten million, I don't know, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just mean, you, you can make them equal to each other. That's what I wanted to, to well, hear. But, but that could be equalized by, for example, our Industrial Technology Research Institute mm -hmm. uh, has been focusing for the past few months on, on making very affordable uh, air pollution detectors uh, for the citizens. And so uh, while at the moment uh, it is based on, you know, as you said, uncertain quality, mm -hmm. because if it's, uh, the sensor gets, you know, polluted or, or when it um, fluctuates a little bit, it actually relies on surrounding data to calibrate. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we, the, the ITRI uh, produces uh, such sensors in a way that doesn't exceed the cost mm -hmm. of the current off-the-shelf components and nevertheless passes the BSMI, um, you know, testing requirements, then that's the best of both worlds. Right, because then the citizen scientists can just use ITR certified uh, sensors, and, and es especially if they uh, get to participate in the, the definition of its specification, its range, and what, what to measure, and things like that. So I, I think what I mean by peer production or social production is the idea that uh, we solve the problem of the problem solvers. Right. So if the citizen scientists report that their measurement device is uh, not accurate enough, we solve that problem. But, but we're not saying that, okay, you're automatically disqualified or, or of a lesser degree. We don't think that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. does, okay. does that make sense? Yeah. Got okay, it. great. Right, so, and then the, the that's on the le left side, which is social innovation and, and collaboration with uh, civil society and things like that. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side, uh, I'm also working on automating uh, the um, administrative uh, public servants workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that if data is produced specifically um, for open data and it's not part of the automated you know, service delivery chain, then it essentially um, relies on the outside uh, third party to verify whether the open data actually works or not because it's not part of the uh, information flow of normal administrative function. Mm -hmm. uh, if it doesn't work or if it breaks, um, the, the downstream would not notice. It's only when the third party uh, notices, then we get the feedback saying, okay, this is broken, yeah. right? So, so the, the whole idea is that um, the data governance and the automated data um, gathering devices should first be part of the administrative workflow, and second, it should uh, result in measurably less burden 
uh, for the administrative functions. So for example, uh, the, there is a project uh, that we did called um, IOT for Public Welfare. Mm -hmm. And this is a special budget project. And this project combines the air pollution data with the disaster uh, recovery data, for example, shelters and things like that, as well as typhoon and weather data, as well as water pollution measurement, as well as earthquake predict anything that is part of the nature that doesn't have privacy concerns uh, is, is game for IoT for, for public welfare. Mm -hmm. And one of the end goals of the IoT for public welfare, especially when it comes to pollution like air and uh, river pollution, is that uh, for the EPA, for the environment, Environmental Protection Agency. At the moment when they get um, some incident uh, response saying that this particular factory or this particular field mm -hmm. is perhaps burning something or smoking something mm -hmm. that causes air or water pollution, they have to actually go there and measure and, and do a lot of preparatory work and their staff is limited. Right, so if we don't design the open data flow with their workflow, then they keep getting overworked and then they have also uh, the obligation to maintain the open data and then this doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. So we designed the KPI, we designed the key performance index as um, how exactly does this save uh, the uh, people, the investigators' time, so that per perhaps in a day they could only look at two or three incident responses, but with the IoT for public welfare, they could uh, check with much finer granularity, they can deploy drones or do other, you know, uh, automatic measurements so that they can process 10 or 12 incidents per day. Mm -hmm. And so that lowers their burden and that uh, increases their work quality because the repetitive work they don't have to do anymore. They can focus on, you know, their domain knowledge work. And so by basically selling open data and data governance as a way to reduce the governmental public servants workload, we try to ensure that they can be the maintainer of the system instead of a, a higher up, a CIO or whatever, uh, being the caretaker. And I think this integration with the go uh, government workflow is the counterpart of the civil society empowerment, which is um, ensuring that the civil society will keep us honest. So these two are like, you know, balanced each other. Uh -huh. uh, what, what you just mentioned here what was very interesting um, uh, because you, uh, so, sorry, um, it's okay. Um, uh, 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 oh, yes, because mm -hmm. you, uh, this, having those not CIOs, maybe or not, because uh, if we can just come back to. to your own working organizations, you you uh, appoint champions mm. so to, say, to every department. That's right. It, the it's a, it participation just, officers, the POs. Yeah. It, it's also uh -huh. it makes the same feeling as what you just mm. mentioned here. Why do you think this approach of, of appointing champions, mm. uh, either to your own or every department or, or mm. what you just mentioned, mm. why, why is that good? Or so a, a, as compared to to what? As compared to having this, so to say, formal uh, hierarchical structure mm -hmm. of, of um, you know, the, the, pop, the boss is here and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. going down. Why well, is it better to have this well, sometimes, champion? Times, sometimes it's better to have champions and sometimes it's good to have a hierarchical control. I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not saying that anarchy is, you know, solution to everything at the moment. Um, but. I think one of the reasons why we appoint champions is that we want to make sure that uh, whenever there is a cross-ministry or cross-departmental case, mm -hmm. um, the, the participation officers, they can talk to the same people uh, across different ministries. Mm -hmm. For example, the IoT for Public Welfare, that is, is essentially like five, six different ministries, mm -hmm. right? So if you have different uh, ministries having, you know, one-shot uh, meetings, mm -hmm. it ends up, it doesn't really accumulate uh, the, the knowledge in, in their ministries. Uh, for each of them, it's just a one-shot relationship. Mm -hmm. But if we have a stable participation officer, we call it a network or a community, then every time uh, you go into a cross-ministry um, case, you meet with the same cohort. 
of participation officers. Yep. As, as any you know, student of Prisoner's Dilemma would tell you, uh, if you know that it's the same bunch of people for the next four years, mm -hmm. then, then you better start building camaraderie and mm -hmm. solidarity because uh, otherwise it, it doesn't pay off in the long run, right? So, so I think that's the main reason why it's champions. The other thing is that it also is like a fractal, it's like a tree in the sense that uh, we also empower through regulations that those ministerial champions can also uh, appoint their agency level, third level champions, which can in turn appoint fourth level mm -hmm. champions. So the idea is that because they are essentially the coordinator for their respective ministry, they can also build camaraderie uh, between those different third level or fourth level agencies when it comes to pub public participation. And I think this is even more important than cross-ministerial um, team because there are existing cross-ministerial communication um, mechanisms, mm -hmm. but there's actually quite few um, <coughs> cross-agency communication across ministries. Mm. So uh, what I'm saying is that when it's more than three levels of hierarchy, usually people don't uh, communicate across silos at all anymore. When it's just one level or two level, people still find some way. Yeah. But when it's three levels deep, uh, there's no way for a third level or fourth level agency in one ministry to contact the third or fourth level in another far away ministry, right? Mm -hmm. But with a participation office and network, everybody is flat on the same rocket chat channel and it's just one click away. And mm -hmm. so that builds this camaraderie more easily than if we have just one CIO and then everybody reports to the same person. Yeah. Besides those uh, yeah. meetings, uh, yeah. and, and how, are, how, are, how, are, how are they communicating with each mm -hmm. other? I mean, which technical platform are you using mm -hmm. or how, how are they which system? Right. Uh, we use the Sandstorm system. Uh, the Sandstorm system is a free software um, design uh, that is certified by our um, cybersecurity department. Mm -hmm. It includes chat rooms, file storage, task management, document spreadsheet editing. Basically, you know, it's like Dropbox plus Facebook plus yeah. Wikipedia plus whatever, right? And, and so, as you can see, it is quite varied. Um, there's collaborative uh, bookmarks, there's collaborative link sharing, there's even an application for ordering lunch box together that, that was um, designed by our uh, one of the public servants here. So, so the idea is that because the basic platform is uh, hardened against uh, cybersecurity attacks, mm -hmm. anyone can write applications very easily without worrying about its cybersecurity implications. And so people start innovating on exactly what they can do uh, to collaborate there. And um, my own office, uh, the PD office about 20, 20 something people here. Uh, every day we just start by looking at this Kanban board mm -hmm. and then we see what everybody is working on, uh, what everybody's um, you know current task completion uh, is doing uh, and as we can see for example this is um, one of our websites and then as part of this website uh, we can see exactly who is res responsible for which redesign um, action and how complete it is and, and things like that. And and so basically this enables uh, a culture of what we call working out loud, mm. uh, meaning that people who don't um, have a direct reporting relationship nevertheless has this ambient feeling mm. of what everybody is up to. And so when there's a ad hoc group that needs to be formed, we can very easily form on a chat room or on a shared uh, mind map or whatever. Here. Got it. Uh, how, in, to w what extent is this used by other departments as well? Is it just just your department or other? No, and and, and champions. So so all. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, 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 champions. Sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, right, so our, our chat room, uh, for example, the, the PO chat, which is the chat, uh, chat room of our participation offices, mm -hmm. um, initially it's just one person, right, from, mm -hmm. from each ministry. But now, because everybody can invite anyone from their ministries, so it's now like 105 people now. Ah. Yeah, so, so that, this is very cross-departmental, as you okay, can see. Okay. Uh, um, uh, I should have uh, asked. I should have re rephrased. I should yeah, have, sure. uh, um, bec because this it feels like this could be used in uh, in the whole governmental mm -hmm. organization, not mm -hmm. not only amongst uh, champions. Mm -hmm. or, or what do you say? W what's your feeling? Could this? Well, 
platform or system? Or well, I, I mean, this is basically a, a set of applications. Mm -hmm. So what we know is that, <clears throat> for example, uh, some departments such as our um, MIS department here, they only use the Kanban board. They don't use anything else. Or for example, uh, when we talk with the Taipei cities, uh, men, um, the DOIT, Department of Information Technologies, they're mostly interested in this uh, organized uh, link sharing bookmarking uh, system and, and little else, for example. And so I think the idea is that we set up this platform and we make sure that anybody who has a any email address that ends in gov.tw automatically gets a user account. Mm. And they can deploy their own applications. They can use one of the existing applications. Mm -hmm. And we don't try to say that you have to use exactly the set of seven applications that we do. It's OK if you just use, it, say, Dropbox replacement, for mm -hmm. example. And that's one of the more popular ones. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, uh, well, we started to talk about this, this uh, government making, making government more transparent. Uh, every Wednesday you work outside the administration in mm -hmm. Social Innovation Lab. That's right. Why? Well, that's one of the things that they asked. Um, when we built <coughs> the Social Innovation Lab, we run a set of five consultation meetings. Uh, basically, we just prepare the hardware, the, the building itself, but we don't define any software. So the software was co-designed by more than a hundred social entrepreneurs, social innovators. And so um, they asked for a kitchen. We, we got a kitchen. They asked for a room uh, with um, whiteboards and uh, with no tables. We got this kind of uh, ideation room. Uh, they asked for a green screen and live streaming equipment. We, we have that. And, but software-wise, they asked for two things. First, that they asked that it opens until midnight. And so now it's open from 7 to 11 in the midnight. Mm -hmm. And then they asked that for me uh, and uh, responsible um, ministries to send their um, window to social enterprise policy making uh, into the service uh, office mm -hmm. and they asked for office hours because it's also a accelerator or incubator for, mm -hmm. for social innovators. So it's natural that mentors have office hours, right? So that's, that's what, what they asked. And so that's what I delivered. So, so, so every Wednesday, technically, um, if you look at the se.pds.tw, which is our social enterprise portal, um, you can see that the Social Innovation Lab um, actually has a, um, Audrey is always here, um, timetable, yeah. uh, which shows exactly when I'm here. Mm -hmm. And so while well, technically it says that every Wednesday from 10 to uh, 2 p.m., uh, that's actually uh, the the um, well, what should we say uh, the the formal uh, schedule. Uh, but in practice, for the past month or so, uh, I'm practically um, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. there. Yeah. So so it's like 12 hours and every Wednesday. And so people gradually think that you know it's not a big deal to just go and talk to a minister. Mm -hmm. And um, aside from the fact that it's all recorded. We also make sure that every other Tuesday we go to the four different uh, regional offices of Taiwan and bring the office hour results to those different areas as well. While the 11 uh, ministries related to social enterprise stay in the Social Innovation Lab, but we set up two-way uh, video conferencing. So they also have their office hour, but remotely. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, you, you have been uh, establishing regulations for, the, for this PO network mm -hmm. and um, you have done uh, many good things, but what are the biggest challenges? Uh, and you mentioned trust, but, but mm -hmm. how? Can, can, you, can you mention more details about how to build the trust? Sure. Um, so one of the uh, ways that the social media uh, is getting people closer is by essentially um, having people who meet each other through common keywords or common causes or, or whatever, right? And so this is what we call swift trust. People very quickly form rapport um, on the social media. But due to the way the current generation of social media is designed, it's easier for a message to go viral if it um, makes people to respond within the first six seconds, basically engaging in people's uh, enragement or in, in people's, you know, um, 
whatever their, their negative feelings are, uh, it's actually easier for, to get people to press share uh, before commenting or before reading everything. So it, it means that counter power is easier to manufacture on social media than power. Because for, for power, you have to actually understand what, what's at stake for all the stakeholders. But for counter power to, to uh, assemble, all you have to do is to point at one example and incite outrage uh, 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 among that photo or among that idea. Right? So uh, we have an e-petition system, for example. There is someone who uh, petitions saying we have an explosively user-hostile text reporting system. And that's perhaps not an exact duration, maybe it really uh, does uh, you know, take four hours or whatever for a Mac or Linux user to finish their text reporting online as compared to a Windows user, which only takes maybe 20 minutes. Right? So, and, but Mac and Linux users are used to better user experiences, so it's doubly insulting for them. And then um, it's very easy for this kind of uh, messages to go viral, because people all have the experience of filing taxes. And also, final taxes are not usually associated with a pleasant feeling. And, and so it's very easy for people to feel for this petitioner and for the social media to, to, f to fill with counter power uh, messages. And that blames the, the vendors, and, and for example. Right? So to rebuild trust, the whole idea is that uh, for people who um, are assembling and measuring um, their counter power and, and petitioning and whatever, uh, we have the participation officers uh, to contact them uh, immediately. And f for this example, I think it is within the first, first 48 hours that our PO decide to contact the petitioner. And it's very interesting because we watch the social media, watch the, the petition. Uh, initially, it's like 90% negative, 10% positive. And, but as soon as we did a contact and saying that we're inviting the people who complain the loudest mm -hmm. into a workshop to, to discover how can we do better, and then it becomes like 80% positive, 20% negative. So it's just like that. And then uh, within a, a couple of weeks, we actually invited everybody. Uh, and then we live stream this workshop over the internet. Mm -hmm. So anyone who doesn't like the text violence system can all see that how is it like uh, for the public servant to uh, engage on a, what we call a user journey mapping uh, of all the touch points. And as soon as that happens, um, the ministries actually see the advantage saying, you know, all those people who complain the loudest are actually UX experts expert service designers, expert um, reporters and journalists, and for example, so they actually know what they're talking about, which is why they're angry than other people, right? Because they, they understand the problem on a deeper fashion, or has, uh, you know, um, suffered for longer than other people. And so, so then uh, the participation office of the um, Ministry of Finance uh, organized five workshops. And so in each workshop, we have various stakeholders, not just citizens and users, but also facilitators, POs, contracted IT companies, and, and so on. And then we collaboratively redesigned the text file system that's last year's, and that's the this year's system. And so as soon as you know this is um, convened, and as uh, soon as this is the, all the log, in, and uh, as well as all the transcript of l any decision leading to this revamping of the text, text file system is published online, people gradually started to anticipate a uh, better solution. Mm -hmm. And they also understand that their contribution is actually taken into account. And finally, anything that's not so good with this year's text file experience, they know exactly how it will be improved on the next year. And so I think this is what we call radically trusting the civil society. Mm -hmm. We trust the people who complain actually have something to contribute, even without any supporting evidence yeah. at the beginning. But but they actually, you know, are people who have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, if we shift a little bit to to uh, open data, sure. um, uh, what is the most important to do in order to publish more open data mm -hmm. and more more and relevant open mm -hmm. data? Mm -hmm. Uh, what would you say? I think I, I did answer that, right? Yeah. First by making the data flow part of the administrative workflow, and then by changing the procurement rules so that it doesn't take an extra step of processing, but actually it produces structured data just as part of the procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, but then also I would like to, to, to add um, how can... Because sometimes when you publish open data, uh, it's not used. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you, you 
publish something, but, but it's not used or mm -hmm. it's not used uh, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you find which data that is that could be most relevant to publish mm -hmm. as open data? Well, <coughs> I mean, our national open data portal, again, we also accept citizen contributions. Mm. So if the government doesn't collect the data yet, we also have civil society and private sector contributing the data, as you can see already with the air pollution mm -hmm. thing. And of course, they also have their own you know, issues to solve, which the government can then play the role of facilitator. Mm -hmm. right? So that's one, one way of knowing it. Uh, the other way, of course, is on the data portal, we also have an uh, area where people can just simply request data. And this is just like a Freedom of Information Act. If we have the data, we just didn't know that people want it. Then and we just publish it. So it's that simple, right? So for things that uh, the government already collects but isn't published yet, at the moment we have a regulation that says it should be open by default. Mm -hmm. So when people ask, it just gets published. That's, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. For things that government doesn't collect, we encourage the civil society to collect. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if it, its uh, collection needs governmental help, like the, uh, the sensor uh, thing that from the ITRI, then we, we have plans to improve uh, the, the data collection activities of private sector and civil society. Well, what I mean is that open data doesn't, it, it's not exclusive to government. It, it's not even primarily government, mm -hmm. but the government can serve as a you know, first try, an example or whatever, and is especially setting up a license that's compatible uh, with all the data users. Yeah. This uh, open by default uh, mm -hmm. uh, philosophy. Yeah. How do you, how did you achieve that? How did you make it possible? Well, I mean, our freedom of information uh, law already specify mm -hmm. that there's only two things that shouldn't be public or should be uh, public only after internal deliberation. Mm -hmm. One is the decisional um, history of a policy before the policy decision is made. Uh, so, so that is um, you know draft data, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's one set of data. The other thing is that um, when it's collected, uh, but it uh, touches on privacy or uh, trade secret or, or any other thing that should, uh, people would reasonably um, only allow this data to be used for a specific purpose, then the then other purposes uh, need to be deliberated before it could be published. And we don't even encourage, um, you know, if it's purely private data, like healthcare, uh, to, to produce this open data, because conceptually, uh, personal data and open data is entirely not overlapping no. categories. No. So in our FOI law, there's already those two um, conditions. Sure, but even, it, it, even if it is, I mean, in Sweden has 350, more than 350 years of, of uh, Openness, so oh, yeah, say. Yeah. Uh, still, though, uh, you, you need to go to the government and ask for specific mm -hmm. data, then you can get it. Yeah. Uh, that's a completely different. Di I mean, mm -hmm. th that's a different thing from from uh, having the government people in government well, actively, well, well, proactively well, well, publishing it, it's open not data. That different, right? So um, the traditional FOIA flow is that you ask for data, the yes. government redacts something and, and then give a copy to you yeah. and then saying, okay, you can, you know, read it mm -hmm. or you can use it for journalistic purposes. Uh, now, the only change is that in addition of providing it to you, mm -hmm. the government also publishes it on the open data platform, mm -hmm. uh, implicitly granting um, derivative work rights to pretty much everybody and also saves their, their time because the next person doesn't have to ask them anymore. Right? So, so as I said, it's part of the administrative simplification mm -hmm. that that's how we convey the message to the public servant. It's basically saying if you publish on the open data portal, we make sure that uh, the legislators, the journalists, the data scientists, they, they, they all know where to look at yeah. and, and they won't bother you again if, if they want a copy of that data. I think that's the main idea. And the public servants, they are, they are fine with that or, or yeah, are they thinking is that, that the data could be interpreted, interpreted in, in, um, in a way that makes it, so to say, uh, not looking accurate? I mean, all data, if it could be mixed, it could, sh it, it could be some uh, mismatch. Does, is this a fear that you feel among the public servants? No, no, not really, because, because if they don't publish the data, the civil society and the private sector nevertheless try to collect data anyway. Mm. Uh, and uh, if they are on a different factual basis as the government policy makers, it actually creates more, more issues. Mm. It's just like after a meeting, if the meeting doesn't have a transcript or a record, 
journalists can still ask participants what happened in the meeting, right? The problem is that the three journalists asking three different participants, they get three different versions of what happened in the meeting, and 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 it, it it's not like. There's no confusion if we don't publish the meeting's transcript, right? The published meeting's transcript,、uh, on the other hand, make sure that the three journalists at least is basing their report on the same factual basis. They can still provide their perspectives, but then at least we don't have to、uh, address the confusion and the rumors and whatever. So, so I think the the idea is just to make factual data spread as fast as rumors, and then we don't worry about rumors that much anymore. Uh, Taiwan was ranked as number one in the global data, global open data、yeah. index, but you said that、mm, it should be taken with a little bit of grain of salt. That's right.、Um, uh, why? Be- because it just measures the very basic data sets,、mm. right? It's just like you know every. Uh, household should have water, should have electricity, should have public roads leading to it. So, so it doesn't really mean much.、Uh, it, it means that you know there's some basic facilities, but beyond those basic data, the open data index doesn't even say anything. Right, so so for us, it, this is like you know primary school level exam that you pass, but it doesn't really say much. Okay, so、yeah. what would do? Do you want to see any alternative, or, or、mm. I mean, do you want to see another index instead well, the, the, of this? Well, the civil society is already doing their own research、mm. using the open data barometer, for example, and or other qualitative、uh, or more impact related assessments, and we do look at those. But we don't think that we should just fix on one particular measurement. We we look at all the different reports from the independent, like Transparency International and the Open Culture Foundation and, and whatever, and then we react accordingly. But but we don't think that we should、uh, just focusing on one particular index and uh, you know uh, base our policy on staying on number one of it. Although it's been two years running, it, we don't play place that much importance because for us it's just you know primary school level stuff.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you you say that you you don't work, or well, for, for the the government.、Right. Instead, you say you work with, with the, the government. That's right. Yeah,、uh, and、um, the the government only only sort of say pays your your salary.、Mm-hmm. Can you just elaborate why do you why is why do you have this approach? Uh, yeah,、um, that's because the the work that I'm doing,、uh, for example, the participation officer work and, and things like that,、um, I relinquish、uh, any and all、um, copyright to it. We actively work and publish papers and so on. So for for me, Taiwan is just one of the places of a global, pretty connected、um, cities. Uh, for example, people in Iceland, people in Paris, people in Barcelona, in in Madrid, in in New York City, and in other places, they are all experimenting with this kind of transparency, inclusive participation, and things like that. So, so for for me, they're they're my colleagues, and and we're we're just working, you know, in respective labs, for example,、uh, and and. Essentially, sharing、uh, the best practice or better practices, and so、uh, when, for example, Iceland has a petition system,、um, user ex-、uh, experience redesign that works really well.、Uh, within a month, you see Taiwan adopting it and, and things like that. So, so I, I think、uh, if I work just for the people in Taiwan,、uh, the influence or the participation base is actually pretty limited because Taiwan, after all,、uh, is pretty new to this democracy thing.、Mm-hmm. But if we、um, take into account The wider community of all the people working on participative、uh, democracy, then we get a much larger constituent、uh, base and can pro- provide better constituency value. So I don't think、uh, my work is limited to Taiwan, and I actually get a lot of users of of this kind of system methods outside Taiwan, even adopting it faster than、uh, the Taiwan regional governments. Yeah,、uh, and this leads to to a, a question about.、Uh, Local, global,、mm-hmm. countries, regions,、mm-hmm. uh, and、um, I mean,、uh, sorry, I had、uh, what was yeah.、Um, how、um, okay? How or maybe I should ask why or if、uh, a national state should should.、Uh, Should earn revenues and and make、uh, companies stay in the country when the payment, labor, and trade will, you know, flow around and, and be more global.、Uh, how, okay, 
re let me rephrase, or let me ask you the question. What's your opinion about, so to say, having a country or, or state view? How, how important is it? Well, for, for open data or open source or open culture in general, you don't see many licenses that restrict its uses to particular countries. We, we, for things related to encryption or whatever, there used to be some regional uh, restrictions, but they're, they're not very um, popular anymore. So nowadays, um, the Creative Commons license, the, the major open data license, the major open source licenses, they don't even refer to countries, right? They're, they're, they're universal. Um, in, in the sense. And so uh, for this kind of work, I would say it is not at all important uh, for nation states or countries uh, as artificial boundaries. It may uh, be more uh, relevant for people who work on the same community to look at, you know, share time zones just because, mm -hmm. right, of, of whether you use email or Skype, right, <laughs> or, or, or shared, um, you know, computer languages or natural languages. Uh, that still makes some distinction, that still makes some sense uh, as the border to form community, perhaps. But I don't think national states play any part in the open data or open source culture. So do you see that the, the, when the global, as the world is becoming more sort of, yeah, global, uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you see that the um, people will be more equal and will be more, you know, the, the, the poverty uh, will be reduced and the rich, will, will people will be more equal uh, in the world when this is happening? Or what, what do you think? Well, I mean, internet was kind of designed uh, with that in mind, right? That that's the, the internet's idea. It's uh, a, a protocol that uh, networks across different networks, mm -hmm. right? That's what the intern means mm -hmm. in the internet. And uh, of course, um, so far it's been working pretty well, but there are, of course, people who want to reinstall national state into the internet mm -hmm. uh, with the ideas called cyber sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, or things like that. Um, and um, so far, I think, um, people who actively work on, on the core internet protocols still have not uh, adopted the cyber sovereignty mm -hmm. view. And so, so it still has this liberalizing or equalizing force, as I've said. But um, I'm also aware that there are thinkers and policymakers who want to rein in internet and its cross-country or even anarchistic participatory nature and try to re reinstate the internet as part of the state's apparatus instead of something that is orthogonal to states. So, so this trend and its counter trend both exists. I'm not denying that it doesn't exist, but so far this seems to be still working. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that this and also automation in general will finally will lead to some, you know, the basic income? Mm -hmm. you, you think? Oh, you mean like universal basic income? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, as experiments or as smaller scale test fields or, you know, as referendum subjects, mm -hmm. uh, we, we see more and more of that popping up. And so, if you ask this question in the idea of, you know, within a century, or within, you know, 500 years, or in one of the planets in the galaxy, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that it will happen in one way or the other, right? But, but I don't really know that uh, where it will happen first, um, but I do know that we need to separate the idea of, of work and tasks. Uh, in order for this to happen. If people identify with particular task and the skills associated with that task and take too much pride into it, and then universal basic income will, will be seen as a, um, you know, a attack mm -hmm. uh, on this kind of proudness of uh, a, a working but really task performing uh, person. But if people see work as, you know, completing life's work or, or, or doing something that has a positive social impact, then any automation is just fuel. Uh, to this life's work, and then people will be much more accepting of universal basic income. So there's a cultural change that needs to happen before the economic change could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. um, th then uh, I th there has been recently a, a big talking about, especially in Sweden, about the Me Too uh, movement. If you can call it. Uh, one question I was. Uh, I got from the crowd oh, yeah. to ask you was was uh, how uh, how the Me Too has been in in Taiwan from your perspective and and you know how how Taiwan is handling uh, sexual harassment in, in mm. workplace and uh, and both mm. 
physical world, but Same more word. importantly, they're online. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, ta <coughs> Taiwan is, um, I would say, uh, pretty advanced, especially in Asia, due to um, you know marriage equality and other very progressive views held both by the current president and the previous one. They're both ahead of their parties when, when it comes to, to this kind of uh, equality. And also representation, uh, gender fair representation, is also constitutionally protected. Mm -hmm. So that gives us some head start. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for each and every regulation, for each and every law, there need to be a uh, gender impact assessment made uh, for the regulation or the law. And there's also a growing awareness uh, of the idea that um, you know, cyberbullying or whatever um, has been given space by a blaming the victim um, activity, for example. And so I think all this has been pretty much dominant uh, culture, uh, even uh, on the youth or teenager uh, mm -hmm. culture in Taiwan. So it gives a relative uh, safe space. Uh, especially when we just talk about the scope of Asia. Mm. Um, and so as a transgender myself and have many LGBTQ friends, of course it's not optimal uh, at the moment as saying, you know, people just don't care about gender anymore or people uh, just, just don't have any Me Too moments anymore. But we at least when there's a public incident, when there's a public discussion, uh, the, the, the social justice uh, people are always the mainstream um, opinion. And there's, of course, counter-opinions, but they are um, strictly in the minority. Mm -hmm. And due to the um, um, you know, marriage equality case, the conservative, or I, I, would, I would say so-called conservative, um, forces are mobilizing and are gathering. And that is true. And mm -hmm. so we see more overt expression mm -hmm. uh, of gender stereotyping and whatever that, that's happening. But, but I think that is just part of the... Um, part of the storm uh, working uh, into the, um, the ratification process of marriage equality. Uh, and I think our administration's uh, strategy of dealing it as a right and privilege issue instead of a, you know, religious, spiritual, cultural issue has its merits. Mm -hmm. Because then people see marriage not as something spiritual but something that is just part of the rights and privileges, um, basically a contract, yeah. right? And so by reviewing line by line uh, e exactly what is being granted, what is being enjoyed, it, it secularizes marriage. And it also makes it much easier for people with different ideologies or different religions to talk with this in economic mm -hmm. terms. And once you get here, it's much harder for gender stereotyping, for harassment, for whatever to grow, because then it becomes an economic argument and, and it's not uh, very gender-based uh, at, at this point then. Yeah. Because in Sweden, it has yeah. affected so many industries. The, the Me Too movement has oh, yeah. it, it has a really huge impact. Mm -hmm. and that's why, because I'm curious how it, how it is mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Did it mm -hmm. also have a big impact here or was it just a, you know, a smaller thing that passed by and, and because you already have yeah, because people generally trust that there is a um, there is a systematic approach to report and handle okay. sexual harassments, and it has a it's like a paracourt system that that handles this kind of work workplace harassments and misconducts. And indeed, in one of the sexual um, harassment cases happened in the university that doesn't go through the usual arbitration channels, that becomes a scandal. Right, so so people, I think, generally has some trust in this kind of arbitration channels that's been around for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when we talk about this, how how is it to, to be uh, being a transgender in, in politics? Mm -hmm. Is it is it challenging in a, in no, a certain it, way? People don't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, uh, a question about the sustainability thing. Uh, what do you think is the next step? that the digitalization can take on sustainability issues. Mm. Uh, what, what do you think that, that how can digitalization help? And, and sure. Well, um, so as you know, the minister in charge of social innovation and social entrepreneurship, uh, we do see that uh, a large number of 
uh, young people and also people who are retiring, as we, we call this cross-generational uh, startups and innovators, uh, they start with the explicit goal of tackling one of the SDG, uh, one of the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and I think that that's a very good sign because that means that Taiwan sees uh, the society as something that can solve problems not just caused by, you know, poverty or regional, um, you know, disasters or issues, but also issues caused by technology, mm -hmm. um, you know, isolation, cyberbullying, um, rising inequality due to automation and things like that. There's plenty of social innovators who start with the explicit goal of transforming uh, how people look at handicapped people, how people look at uh, blind people, how people look at uh, people who uh, deal on the street in a wheelchair and things like that. And so there are, are concerted efforts to make um, not just social influence, but social impact mm -hmm. when it comes to those development goals. And um, it is also our goal um, in, in the national government uh, to provide as much as possible uh, regulatory leeway mm -hmm. to those people. Because when those people mm, discover a, a new way to, to have social impact, they usually more often than not run into existing regulations. But because they share the government's goal of furthering public good, of solving you know, sustainability issues, mm -hmm. uh, we give them precedence uh, in um, trying to harmonize the regulations in their favor mm. and trying to uh, uh, redo our interpretations of laws so that they can innovate or even designing sandbox laws where they can be illegal uh, and run counter to rules for six months, for 12 months and then writing a report and then you know proving to the society that this new approach actually is beneficial to the society. And if it's not, of course, it just paid the tuition for everybody else afterwards. But if it does work, then it gives a very strong case uh, for the regulators and the lawmakers to adjust laws in their favor. And so purely for-profit companies doesn't really enjoy this kind of practice priority treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, may I just change the microphone? Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Here. Let's see. Because now, uh, let's just swap this. It, it can still be here. Okay. It will not uh, just be used here. Because Uh, because uh, now we would like to ask um, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, bit more sure. about uh, economy, uh, yeah. more e financial economy, sure. econ economic news. Um, Taiwan is is uh, Taiwan is sometimes uh, referred to as the Silicon Valley of uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what's the difference between Asia's Silicon Valley and the Silicon Valley in the United States? Hmm. Well, I don't know where you got this Asia Silicon Valley idea. But uh, when I get into the cabinet, my first contribution is to rename Yazhou Siku, uh, Silicon Valley in Asia, into Yazhou Lianjie Siku, Asia dot Silicon Valley, meaning that we're a hub that links the Asia people and a hub uh, that links the uh, innovations uh, from the Silicon Valley and the innovations um, here in Asia. So we see ourselves as a connector of talents, of resources, of regulations uh, at times, but we don't see ourselves as a Shanghai or a copy of Silicon Valley in Asia. That would actually be absurd. And so, so that's, that's one of my first contributions going to the cabinet, is just renaming the Asia SV plan into the Asia dot SV plan. Okay, uh, how, can the, how can the digital revolution affect the, the global and local economy? First, there's not just one digital revolution, there's many digital revolutions, one riding on the wave of another. If you just look at the hype cycle, there's a bunch of revelations uh, coming up. But I think by far the most important thing is that it enables people to think about equality 
in a way that is currently um, um, imaginable, but just a hundred years ago was unimaginable. When we talk about, for example, regional balance or equality of education, for example, people wait on you know uh, high speed rails or waiting on roads going to their homes and so on. And all of this takes like five years, ten years, and it's very difficult to、uh, take into the equality into every rural area and so on. But now with a lot of education services.、Um, Medicine even、uh, deliver over the internet in Taiwan. We actually have one of the highest、uh, percentage of internet penetration rate and mobile use, and also you know gender equal use of services online. So whereas before the promise of equality and the actual delivery through physical or analog ways、uh, always leaves something to be desired, and at the moment it's actually very easy or at least attainable for our president to promise broadband. As human right, access to AI as human right, access to whatever basic education, ICT as part of the curriculum as human right, and actually delivering it in a matter of a couple of years, and so it would be almost impossible without the digital technologies. Now, so. Yes. Okay. Also, also, I know we talk about several digital revolutions, but from your perspective,、um, how is it, how is is this shift affecting the business relations in in Asia,、uh, Taiwan, and the rest of Asia, and the European Union?、Hmm. Well,、um, the di- the digital、um, services and digital goods, of course, creates a harmonization issue between every different、um, countries' laws. For example, when Uber first came to Taiwan,、um, it classified itself as just another app. Uh, but for many other countries and other people,、uh, they are a kind of rental car service, and that creates a a dissonance. Uh, between people's different interpretations of overbroad terms such as sharing economy and, and things like that. So、um, first, that it creates confusion, and from the confusion、uh, creates fear because people will fear that their jobs getting displaced, automation taking people's、uh, work away, their dignity away,、uh, and and then from the, from there, people also create doubts because、um, there are people who say algorithms are more efficient than laws, so we don't have to obey laws anymore, and so on. So it also corrodes、uh, people's、um, trust in the government and the governance system, and also legitimacy of any、uh, nation states. And so we see all that dynamic、uh, happening. And Uber is just one of the many cases.、Uh, in Taiwan, we try to address that by bringing the open multi-stakeholder system, which is the same system that how internet、uh, governance. Has been working to govern issues such as you know cross-country protocols,、uh, security issues, and everything that relates to internet governance without、uh, the idea of states or without the idea of a sovereign control. So the idea is that we ask people that okay, we share the basic facts. We also crowdsource data from everybody, and then we ask people what are your feelings? What are the feelings that you you see when you、uh, look at those numbers? When you <coughs> have this、uh, Uber. Driving experience. What what are your feelings really? What are your doubts and fears and joy? Perhaps everybody has different feeling. And and the good thing about a feeling oriented consultation process is that there is no right and wrong. Everywhere、uh, in different parts of the country, people can participate just on their mobile phone、uh, and share their feelings. And then what we see is that with just the right design,、uh, we use、uh, machine learning. To cluster people's feelings, and we say that if people can propose a subtle or a、uh, nuanced feeling that resonates with the supermajority of people, then we give them binding power, meaning that we bring them into the political agenda and use it to talk with Uber, with Taiwan Taxi, with the、uh, Taxi Drivers Union, and so thousands of people contributed, and and finally、um, have a set of seven、uh, consensus items, which we then check one by one with all the stakeholders, and then translate it into law. So this is what we call crowdsourced agenda setting, and I think this is one of the key things that really needs to happen if we are to harmonize、uh, the digital services and products across so-called、um, nation or or country、um, borders, because people who are affected by any technology across different countries they have more in common in each other than people who just happen to live next door. 
but it's not affected the same way. We see the same thing with climate change. People who, who live very close to the ocean and, and you know, are seeing their, their, their um, households uh, being perhaps destroyed within the next decade have more in common with each other than people in the same nation but doesn't you know, live in the same elevation. So, so we really do need uh, ways to get more solidarity, more familiarity with people in those feeling with the same feelings and also a way for the existing regulatory system to take into account those stakeholder feelings and then trans translate it into regulations and laws that everybody can live with. And so that's, I think, is the digital revolution's impact, main impact on governance and especially on cross-country or cross-border governance. Taiwan was very early with the semiconductor. Much of Taiwan's mm -hmm. uh, wealth is built on yeah. semiconductors. Um, and then it started to shift more to yeah, still lots of uh, semiconductors, but then more and more software. Mm -hmm. What do you see about the, where will the future be? How will the future growth be mm -hmm. from, for Taiwan? Well, I think uh, semiconductor, of course, is still a very important part of Taiwan, and we, we see it as the, the driving force, because there are many um, AI-related or IoT-related applications that does require creative chip design. And, and especially uh, when we work very closely with people who are working closer to, to human beings, the service designers, the user experience designers, we don't arbitrarily say, okay, these are software people, these are hardware people. Uh, my own experience working with Apple for, for six years is that everybody listened to designers, and designers listen to people, right? So, so instead of, you know, shipping products or, or designing products, I think we are more and more in the civil society and the private sector in Taiwan seeing this just as a, a service design part of the ecosystem, and the hardware people and the software people are just there to respond to the demands of society. Because if we see it as a product design, then we will worry about, okay, there is a new technology, why isn't the adoption rate already 80%? And those very arbitrary competition-based uh, views uh, for particular technology. And we did that, you know, with WiMAX and with other <laughs> technologies. It didn't really do us much good. So, so I, I think the idea is not just locking in to particular new and exciting technologies, but instead using sandboxes, using social innovation hubs and things like that for every new technology to have a way to connect to existing software and hardware and service and every other ecosystem and collaboratively break some laws, break some regulations, do some experimentation and try to figure out how the society can reconfigure itself for, to everybody's benefit. And if it doesn't work, well then we design the way so that it, uh, the risk is absorbed not by one single public servant or one single innovator, but instead the whole ecosystem just takes the uh, post-mortem and then do something better. So, so I think the idea in Taiwan is to have a more holistic, more integrated ecosystem. And I think Taiwan, because of our absolute freedom of expression, you can't say anything that gets you arrested. Unlike many other Asian countries, uh, there are many other you know, law-breaking ideas <laughs> that we still uh, look forward for our local innovators to, to propose and combine different fields and different disciplines together instead of, of just looking at one or two industries and say, this should be our national direction. We're now promoting social innovation in all different industries, and especially merging those different uh, fields and disciplines. Well. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, very, very much. Uh, I, I think I've asked uh, all the questions I, 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 I would like to ask. Mm -hmm. um, or do you feel that there is something that yet you were thinking of that you should mention that you haven't mentioned? No, no, it's good. No, yeah. Yeah. perfect. Because then I will mm. stop here and we'll okay. demount everything, and, and uh, I will. Uh, Right, and I'll do send, some editing. <laughs> I'll send you a transcript also. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Actually, mm -hmm. could we just take some, uh, just take some pictures? I I'm noticed sure. uh, at the door here, yeah. all the other ministers they have dark doors with small windows. Oh, yeah. You have very big windows. Oh, yeah. Which, <laughs> and so with lots of post-it notes. Yeah. With post-it notes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. maybe I can just, um, sure. you know, take some pictures uh, with you there. Okay.